to the time of communion as we do every month and we will once again stop and consider the fact that your son came to die for us to be buried and to be risen again I thank you that last Sunday we could gather and remember Easter and the and and the truth of the resurrection and how without the resurrection we would have no salvation and so, Lord, Lord, this morning, may you just again freshly remind us of what it means that your son surrendered all for us. And Lord, if there are things that we're holding back, things that we're not willing to give up, I pray that you'll put the spotlight of the word of God upon it, even this morning. May we surrender that to you. I thank you for taking care of our folks and especially these that we have seen here this morning and even Lily as she comes. We pray for her safety as she comes. And, but Lord, I just thank you that you have ministered to the hearts of these ones. May they continue to, um, may they continue to see your hand of healing in their lives. Lord, I would pray for the Fernandez family this morning as Steve passed away and went on home to heaven on Easter. I pray that that family will know your grace and that, Lord, it would be an opportunity for them to give testimony of your great grace. And, Lord, we would even think of the Rick Warren and his family this morning over the things that have happened in their lives. And I pray that, Heavenly Father, you would again apply your grace in their situation. We just ask, Lord, that in all of our lives we might lift up the name of our Savior so that others would be drawn unto him and that we would see folks come to faith in Christ. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just before I turn it over to you, Ron, uh, I meant to say two things that I prayed for that you, pro that you heard me pray for. Some of you have been praying for Pastor Steve Fernandez for the last few months. Uh, he had a, a brain tumor. He was the pastor of uh, in Vallejo at um, Community Bible Church, and he was the president of Cornerstone Seminary where Pastor John went, and uh, he had fought a brave battle for about seven months. He passed away last Sunday, Easter Sunday. The Lord uh, promoted him to glory. What a great day. Wouldn't that have been a great day to go home to be with the Lord? And so you pray for that family. But I'm sure most of you have seen it, but uh, what a tragedy Rick Warren and his family are facing. Their 27-year-old son committed suicide on Friday. And you know what? Whether or not I uh, find his approach to things my approach or even what I would agree with the Bible, it doesn't really matter. Uh, at this point, we need to pray for him and his family and their church. I noticed that his, I think it's his brother-in-law that was to be preaching today. In, uh, in his church and uh, as, you, as we go through our service today you might really pray for Saddleback and uh, for Rick Warren and his family as they deal with this and the days that lie ahead and all of that uh, I think it'd be great for us to pray for him and I meant to mention that and I forgot so throughout the service as we think of uh, what the Lord puts on our heart may that be something on our hearts as well so Take your hymn books, if you would, please, and turn to number 210. 210, then stand with me as we sing the verses of Jesus Paid It All.
with one another this morning, rejoicing in his mercy. Make your way back to your seats. If you would, take your bulletin. And your bulletin, you'll find the scripture reading for this morning. You'd pull that out. We'll read together from Romans chapter 3. I'll read the light print. And if you would, respond with the dark. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Be justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. To demonstrate at the present time His righteousness that He might be just You may be seated. As we remember that he is the one who gave us his propitiation, turn to number 181. 181, were you there when they crucified my Lord?
we remember, we cherish what it is to know the Savior. Look to the screen and let's sing it from our hearts, knowing you. trust every day as you and I get up, put our feet on the floor and start a new day, I do pray that that's our desire is to know the Lord better, to know that we can never get to a point where we have arrived and we don't have anything more to learn, but getting to know our Lord every day. You know, again, we come through communion so often, every month, 12 times a year, depending on how long you've come to church, how long especially you've been saved. I mean, you've been at a communion table for, man, hundreds of times. And I trust that this time it will not just be like the last time. As our men come this morning, I want to read a passage out of the book of Psalms. Psalms 1, 2, and 3 somewhat hang together. Some would say that Psalm 1 and 2 are actually one psalm and they broke it up. Psalm 1 is about our walk. 
and I want you to hear again these familiar passages. Psalm 2 is about God's wrath, and we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning in Ephesians. And Psalm 3 is about our worship, and that's what we come to do. But I want you to ask yourself this morning as you approach the communion table, which of these two kinds of people that are being described in Psalm 1 are you? Are you the blessed man or are you the ungodly man? Listen to what the psalmist said. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And he'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. They bring forth its fruit in its season and whose leaf will not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so. They're like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous but the way of the ungodly will perish. This morning, as we come to the message this morning, we're going to talk about the way we were in the past. So if you've come to Christ as your Savior and you have, you have been redeemed and you know you're a child of God and these elements don't just represent religion, but rather represent how your relationship to Christ was formed in His death and burial and resurrection. This morning, I want you to think back. I want you to think back to what it was like before you were saved. Even if you got saved as a young child at six or seven. But if you got saved later, like in your teenage years or maybe on into the, your adult years, where you have a lot of recognition of that and a recollection of that, stop and think about the way you were. And then praise God this morning that he didn't leave us there. He made a way for us to be saved and to be cleansed. And praise God, that blood of Jesus cleanses us from every sin, every day. So I trust again, these elements will be reminders of that. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to this time of communion. We know that again, it's an opportunity to be reminded yet again of very familiar truths, and sometimes that familiarity makes it so that we don't seem to be impacted much about it. May today, in a fresh way, in a new way, may your Holy Spirit burn into our hearts what all of this means. Lord, cause us to see what we were like when we were the ungodly before you brought us into salvation and made us the blessed man. And Lord, when we see that picture, cause us to be so thankful for your grace that rescued us from that, cleansed us, made us different. May you be glorified in the time of our communion service, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus said this, remember me when you do this. Around the table that night, they would have partaken of at least four cups. And so again, as the cup is passed, just remember how amazing it must have been, not only amazing, but confusing and bewildering a bit when Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And uh, how we have so much better understanding of that. So I trust that as the cup goes around, you'll think about what Jesus did for us on the cross and shedding his blood. So, Pastor John, I'll have you pray and then we'll distribute the cup. Dear Father, as we continue on, we thank you so much for the sacrifice that your son made upon the cross on our behalf. The Lord, even as it says in your word, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. The Lord, the love for that blood that your son shed on the cross, we would not have. It. We would have no standing before you as a righteous God. Lord, because of what your son did and the righteousness he has placed upon us, we do have a right to stand before you and believe. And Lord, we thank you for that. I pray that we would daily remember the sacrifice of the Lord. That we would daily live our lives in response to that sacrifice. As the ability that you've given us to your son. I pray you send us your presence.
Zester was playing that song, the first one just before this, was the old Fanny Crosby hymn, He Hideth My Soul. I think, yeah, wanted to make sure. But um, listen to the words. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows the dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand, and covers me there with his hand. As I was singing it to myself, I was thinking of Psalm 1 because, you know, that was the difference. You notice that, right? The godly, the blessed man is like a tree that flourishes and is green and has all the water it needs. The ungodly are like chaff. You know what chaff is? It's just dry, dusty stuff that comes, comes off the grain. It's dry. It, it doesn't have anything. There's no substance to it. And that's the, I thought, that's, that's it. We live in a dry, thirsty land before we come to Christ. And then God brings us to himself and he gives us that place to hide. And he gives us the water of life so that we can be fresh and prosper and green. I just, again, it just, it just struck me because I just think that, again, sometimes we're choosing the dry, thirsty land. And we're giving up the water of life. Jesus said, remember me when you do this. Let's stand, if you would, and form our circle. And what I'd like to do is, um, Ron, maybe you can help us sing a cappella, Amazing Grace. We sang it last week, but I thought, eh, let's, let's do it one more time, but this time we'll sing it a cappella.
Where he leads me, I will follow. We go because he paid the price. Look to the screen and we'll sing it together. Jesus died my soul to save. We should never ever get over the fact that God loved us. I've told you the story before, but I would tell you again, a man by the name of Robert Dick Wilson, who was a great theologian at the turn of the, well, can't say that anymore, turn of the century, I mean the turn of the 20th century, and well you can say it, but I don't mean the turn of the 21st century, but anyway he knew they say 26 languages, tremendous Hebrew scholar. They said that he was just brilliant. And a student asked him once, Dr. Wilson, what is, the, what is the most profound thought you've ever had? And he said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And I often think of that because when I think of God's love, I mean, really, he didn't... When we look at the picture that we're going to paint today, when we look at the way that we were before salvation, why would anyone love us but he did so I, I trust that as we go through this you'll recognize that if you have your Bible would you open with me to Ephesians in chapter 2 I mean if we were to go around the room this morning and ask what verses of the Bible have you committed to memory I would dare say many of you could give me Psalm 23 1 probably all of you or most all of you could give me John 3:16. And I would assume there'd be a great percentage of us that could quote Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. 
And we talk about that verse, for by grace we be saved through faith, and yet not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we quote it, and again, it's like our, so many times I talk about, sometimes we become so familiar with things that we lose the impact. And sometimes I'm afraid we have so taken 2, 8, and 9 off the page that we have failed to spend much time in what came before it. So this morning we're going to spend time in what comes before it. I will tell you already, just in case you need to know this, on a scale of 1 to 10, with on a scale of 0 to 10, with 0 being negative and 10 being positive, this message this morning ranks about minus 5. This is not a whoop up your self image message. This is not designed to get you to feel good about yourself. It's designed to get us to feel badly about ourselves. Because that's what Paul does. And I'm sorry if you go away saying, well, phew, Pastor wasn't very positive today. I'm telling you right up front, okay? There's no, there's no need to uh, tell me the door, Pastor, that was negative. I know it is. And I wish, in some regards, I wish I didn't have to spend any time on it, but I do. Because I really do believe that if we don't get a, a clear picture of verses 1 to 3, there's no way we'll be amazed by grace. I just don't think we will be. Now, before we get to chapter 2, verse 1, let's just remind ourselves of chapter 1. It was about salvation. It was about the blessings from heaven, the things that God has blessed us with, things like redemption and election and sanctification and are seated with the, with the, the Son in heaven. And then Paul list, gives us a recording, as it were, writing it out of a prayer that he prayed on behalf of the Ephesian believers, but of believers all over. I think it was a prayer that Paul would have prayed for many people. And he talks about God's greatness in our lives. He talks about the riches of his glory, the hope of his calling. He ended it in verses 22 and 23 by saying, and God has put all things under the feet of foot of Christ, as it were, and gave him to be the head over all things, even under the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Wow. I mean, here it is, Jesus, through his church, is extending the gospel to the world. You need to notice connectives, words like and and but and yet, words that connect things together, because if you'll notice, chapter 2 and verse 1 says, and. He doesn't necessarily begin even a new thought, as it were. He doesn't even... It doesn't seem like he's moving into something completely separate because there are times when there are no connectives and you know that the author has now moved on to something completely different. But he doesn't do that. He says, and. I think he's trying to get us to again and the readers to understand that the conditions of Ephesians 1 of God's great grace and salvation to the praise of the glory of his grace three times. Now he says, I need you to come back and understand what you were like. I want us to read verses 1 to 10. And I want you to notice the past tense and the present tense in these verbs as I read. And you who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the desires of the flesh, fulfilling those desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, has made us alive together with Christ. 
By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Why? For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it, faith, is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Now, here's the deal. The past tense of these verbs if we will, the way we were is only applicable this morning if you have been saved. See, if you're here this morning and you're lost without Christ, this is a description of the way you are. Paul only uses the past tense because he's writing to people who have responded in faith to the gospel. They have been saved. They are the saints. That's what he's been telling us. He writes to the saints who are in Ephesus. So he can put it in a past tense. But my fear this morning is as I describe it as past, that you will all assume, well, it's past to me too. It may not be. It's only in your past if you've trusted Christ you need to be honest with yourself this morning. I mean, God already knows the truth, by the way. You don't have to be honest with Him, per se. I mean, He already knows if you're here saved or not. Now, you can be honest with me if you'd like, and eventually come up forward and say, Pastor, I, I don't know the Lord is my Savior. I need somebody to lead me to Christ and show me what that means. You can be honest with us, but you know, most of all, need to be honest with yourself because you know in your heart, is this past or is this present? So I'll leave that between you and the Holy Spirit. So I'll speak in past, assuming you understand that none of this is past if you're not a believer. I want you to notice again the way he describes our past life. It's a very pessimistic view. It is not very optimistic. We've spent time looking at sin and we've already looked at some things. But I mean, again, to me, I always figure if God speaks about it more than once, so should I. So that's why we're going to be back looking at sin. And Paul's pessimistic view of the lost man is very clear. We are dead in trespasses and sins. Just in case we missed it, he repeats it in verse 5. You were dead in trespasses and sins. Now folks, people who are dead, I mean physically dead, they are not sick, they are not weak, they are not disabled. They are dead. There's a difference. Somebody said once that somebody, some apparently a wife, put on her headstone, I told you I was sick. <laughs> anyway, I wasn't sure exactly how, but anyway, she, she no longer is sick even if she was, had been. She's dead now. See, sometimes we want to make the lost person out to be really in bad shape. I mean, really in danger. They're sick, their weak sin has debilitated them. That's not true. They're dead. Dead people don't respond. Try it sometime. Go into a funeral home and yell fire. I'll guarantee you the person in the coffin won't move. They won't get up. They're dead. So this morning when we look, the first thing we see is we are dead. And notice plural, 
trespasses and sins. Plural. Why? Because it's not only that we are dead because of Adam's choice. We are dead because we demonstrate it by our own trespasses and sins. What's the difference? Well, a trespass is just what it sounds like. A trespass is we have wandered off of the right path onto the wrong path. Every now and again, people love to drive on our drive, on our property through our one and only entrance. I mean, that driveway is the only way to come onto this church property. I mean, you can, I mean, if you're driving, you can walk on from a lot of different areas. But if you're driving on, you have to drive down the parking lot. And every now and again, I see people out in the back doing things that they ought not to be doing. And so I walk out and I try to some, I try to be, I, I always try to be very gracious at the beginning and then I become somewhat less gracious at times when people are less gracious with me. People who act like this is like their property. And so I say to them, you know, I'm really sorry, but I can't have you doing that. Well, why not? Well, actually this is private property. Oh, it is? And I, and I have asked this more than, did you come through that driveway? Yes. Well, is it your driveway? No, okay, it's our driveway. You came onto our property. You are trespassing. This isn't your property. It's not your uh, playground. It's not your basketball court. Like, we built the basketball court. I don't, we, we are, we're happy if people want to come and use it properly. But just the other day, last Sunday, in fact, Easter Sunday, we came and, and it was obvious things were not done properly out there. And uh, so we went on the video cameras that we have and we could find the people who came on and, and did things that they shouldn't have been doing. And, and in fact, we came this morning and it looks like someone has returned and done some things they shouldn't have been doing. So we're going to try to look at our video cameras and see if we can't figure out who was trespassing. Who was here doing what they shouldn't have been doing? Well, that's what a trespass is. When we are, we're, we're off of God's path. We're not doing what God has said to do. We have, we have, let's see, Isaiah said, we have gone our own way. In a little bit, we're going to talk some more about how Paul describes us walking according to the course of this world. And so, so what you're going to hear is, is that that's a, that, that pretty much sums up the world's philosophy. Frank Sinatra saying it, I'll do it my way. Frank, you can do it your way, but if your way isn't right, doesn't matter how well you did it your way. If it's wrong, it's wrong. And here, Paul said we're dead in our trespasses and then our sins. The word sins is a little more general of a term. It just means all the wrong things we've done. Some have described it as missing the mark. Some have said that, again, this word just kind of sums up all the other words that relate to sin. Paul said that our life, we are dead in the sphere of sins. That's what our life is made up of. Before we're ever saved, we are people who are dead. But I called my message the walking dead because verse 2 says, in which you once walked. The walking dead zombies. You know, sometimes there are no such things as real zombies. We understand that, right? I mean, there, are, there, there aren't really physically dead people who can get up and walk around. Um, there are some former dead people that walked around, like Lazarus. But, there's no, but there are no zombies, okay? But, I, but when I read that, I thought to myself, yeah, see, that's kind of spiritual zombies. They are spiritually dead for sure. They have no spiritual life. They have no desire for God. They have only a desire to sin. That is all they do continually. It doesn't mean they're as bad as they can be. It just means they're always generated, energized by sin. And even though they're dead, they physically walk. I mean, that shouldn't surprise us. We did the same thing. Up until I was 13 years old, I was a walking dead man. Up until I was age 13, when I trusted Christ as my Savior to Ohio Baptist Acres, 
I was a walking dead man. This morning in Bob's class, he was talking about the Damascus Road experience. When I wrote it in my notes, I put Damascus Road, R-D, you know, abbreviated it. And I thought to myself, I wonder what road Ohio Baptist Acres was on. Sometimes we talk about our Damascus Road experience, you know, when we get saved. So I thought to myself, I'm going to look it up. It doesn't exist anymore, but I'm going to look it up and see if anybody might have put uh, the name of the road or street that Ohio Baptist Acres was on. Because I'm going to be able to say then, that's my whatever, James Avenue. That's where I used to live. That's not where I got saved. But that's my James Avenue experience. See, all of us are walking a road. And, and here's what I want us to do this morning. Before we go any further, I want us to look at how Paul describes this sin, this walking in sin. I have found it interesting over the last few years especially, I don't, I don't know that I remember it so much in the past, but I certainly remember it more so in the last few years, the talk about evil in our society. I went back and looked, I went back and looked it up, since the, since the um, Columbine shooting in 1999, April 20th, 1999, since that shooting, there, I found no less than 30 mass shootings in America. 30. The last one being the Newtown shooting. And I thought, there's evil in the world. But you know, the world doesn't like to talk about evil because if they do, I mean, let's face it, if there's evil, then there's got to be righteous. If there's wrong, there has to be right. And we're going to talk about how the world sees it in a minute because of the, because of the way even Paul puts it. But I'm sure that you, the name Geraldo Rivera, to most of you, you know who that guy is. He's not your most um, conservative pundit in the world. Geraldo Rivera has done a lot of things in his life. But I found this quote by Geraldo Rivera after the events of Newtown. I found it so intriguing. He said those events, he said, it is so unconscionable. It's beyond description. It is so... Evil doesn't do it. It doesn't explain sufficiently the wickedness, the depraved, reckless indifference to the lives of these children. It's just something, as a father of five, I absolutely cannot get out of my head. I thought to myself, isn't it interesting? Finally, Geraldo Rivera has used the word evil. Now, don't misunderstand me, please. What happened in Newtown, what happened in Columbine, and all in between was an expression of evil. But so were a lot of other things. Evil in our society is a part of society because we live in a world of sin. We live in a world of sinners. It was interesting to me as I went back and tried to look at such things. I mean, it was interesting. Words like barbaric, monstrous, atrocities, fiendish were used quite a bit to describe things that have happened in our world. An event that happened almost 40 years ago now in a far off place that most of us We'll never get, a couple of us, few of us have had the privilege to go there, and that's in Cambodia. If you remember a guy by the name of Pol Pot, and if you remember the killing fields of Cambodia, those killing fields, I remember the first time I ever got to go to Cambodia, and Charlie and Lourdes took me out, and a couple of the other Cambodians, and we went outside of Phnom Penh to the, to the apparently the most well-known of all the killing fields. 
Of all the killing fields, they say that Pol Pot killed upwards, depending on who you read, somewhere between two to maybe three million total men, women, and children. There's an 11 story tower, I think it's 11 stories, 11 story tower filled with skulls on every level, which don't even represent a, a fraction of the million people they, they estimate were killed in that one killing field. An atrocity. And we call Pol Pot evil, and he was. Don't misunderstand me. We could go back to the Holocaust. Five to six million Jews killed by Hitler and his, all of his people. When we were in Poland and went up to Treblinka, where there's nothing left of the, not a concentration camp, just a killing camp. That's all it was. We think of Auschwitz. Auschwitz was more of a concentration. They killed them, but they also had them there housed. But Treblinka, all it was was an extermination camp. That's all it was. 20 minutes from the time they arrived to the time they were in the gas chambers. Most, that was the average, 20 minutes. And they were gone. They killed a million, I think it was a million five, million eight, something like that in Treblinka. Evil. But I found an interesting article because the world says that, well, you know, Hitler was evil, but he was only evil because we have decided he was evil. This author said, well, we've kind of invented the concept of evil. It's like, no, there's evil. It's called sin. And we walk in this world all the time. I thought of things like natural disasters. I've said it before, but isn't it interesting? When a hurricane, tornado, whatever ha hits, it's an act of God. God gets blamed for it. That's in our insurance papers. They'll insure your house against everything except an act of God, like an earthquake or a, you know, those kind of tornado. An act of God isn't covered. Why does God get blamed for all of that? And yet all around us we see the results of that. I thought of such things like this. How many articles have you read? I remember reading of one just recently. That's why it prompted my thinking. People who will target the elderly out of their money. Some guy will come and say, you know, your roof needs to be repaired. If you'll give me a check for $5,000, I'll get started on it tomorrow. And how many people write the check? never to see the guy again. Evil. Sin. That's what makes up our world. I mean, that's, that's what makes up our world. And evil is seen most clearly in death. For the wages of sin is death. Every day you can pick up your newspaper if you so desire and turn to the obituary page and you will find on that obituary page any number of people and virtually every day it will be all kinds of ages, all kinds of status, rich, poor, all kinds of neighborhoods. I looked it up. In the year 2009, there were 2.5 million deaths in America. 2.5 million people died. The greatest percentage of people die from heart disease. The second greatest percentage of people die from cancer. By the way, I mentioned all those mass killings. There's more people that die every year from diabetes than from mass shootings. Just, just to give you a little perspective. But everybody who dies is a demonstration of the effect of evil and sin. There was no death before sin. God said in the day that you eat of it, you will surely, what? 
die. And they did. Spiritually, they died. Physically, they began to die. Death. Death is, a, is the greatest illustration of evil in our society. And just in case somehow we have not remembered it, every one of us will die. A hundred years from now, every one of us in this room today will be dead. And it will be an example of evil. And so physical death reminds us of sin. Now, now folks, here Paul says that we're already dead spiritually. And while we're dead spiritually, he says we're walking according to the course of this world. According to the way the world functions. Our choices are based on <coughs> the world of the devil. Think about it. It's interesting. There are two main words for the word world, translated the word world in our New Testaments. One is the word cosmos, which is the word for our orderly world. Then there's another one, aeonos, which means uh, the age. And so when Paul says the course of this world, he uses both of those words and puts them together. And so the kind of the, the translator is left a little bit in a quandary. Man, how do I translate? I, I, I'm not going to translate it according to the world of this world. That wouldn't make any sense. The age of this world might make a little more sense. And so most translators have said it like this. It's the course. It's the way the world is going. It's the direction they're going. And when we were lost in our unsaved condition, our lives walked in the way of the world. We thought, we acted, we chose according to the world's standard and philosophy. Let me see if I can quickly go down through here. I've got 11 things. I've got less than 11 minutes. So let me just see if I can give you at least these 11. This is, a, this is the way the world thinks. What is the world? I'm going to call it secular. So I'll call these all secular. What is a secular theology? That's easy. Atheism. Secular theology says there is no God. The world of our day wants us to believe there is no God. Now, be very careful with that because we've seen a whole rise in spiritualism. We've seen a great, great rise in, in people wanting to become spiritual. So maybe at least we can say, secular theology would say, there is no God, at least not the God of the Bible. And by the way, atheism is the absolute backbone to one of the other things I'll say, which is evolution. I mean, to have evolution, you must have no God. Once you introduce a supreme deity into the universe, you will cease having to believe in evolution. Secondly, the secular philosophy. The secular philosophy is naturalism. Everything just goes on naturally. Everything just works according to natural order. What that means is, is because their, their theology says there's no God, they're naturalists because they don't believe there's any supernatural things. There is no supernatural. Now again, in our day and age, we're hearing more about ghosts and all of that kind of stuff, and that's a lot different. In fact, that fits right into a secular worldview. But their philosophy is just naturalism. Everything just happens. It just goes on. The secular ethics is relativism. Secular ethics says it's all about my experience. And look, my experience is as valid as your experience. <clears throat> And if I like my experience, I'll choose mine over yours. Because there is no standard. That's why it's, it's disingenuous. I like that word. I think it's disingenuous of the secularist to even speak about evil. Because to call something evil, you had to have a standard by which to call it that. See, the secularists 
who want us to believe everything is relative. There is no eternal truth. There is no right or wrong. Then if there isn't any right or wrong, why can't I murder you? It's right for me to murder you. I mean, you understand I'm being facetious here, right? In fact, those of you that are listening, just to hopefully they didn't turn off right then. You know, uh, huh, that would have been bad. <laughs> but you get my point, I hope. See, if I, how can we have any standard if relativism is true? Then maybe I, that's the way I was bent. Maybe I was born to be a murderer. And who are you to say I'm wrong? Actually, there are cultures that believe that, you understand. I mean, I'm not just being completely uh, ludicrous here. The secular world of relativism, fourthly, the secular science is absolutely Darwinism, or what some have called neo-Darwinism, because nobody believes what Darwin believed anymore. I mean, Darwin's beliefs have been so changed it's almost impossible to call people Darwinists. But of course Darwin just and his evolutionary philosophy says everything just happened by chance. Everything just happened. Everything just happened. Everything just happened. I don't know about you, but that always seems so crazy to me when I think about that. Because that's, that is the question to ask people, right? Well, where did everything come from? Like, where did the stuff come to blow up in the Big Bang? I mean, where did it all come from? Nobody has that answer. The secularists don't have an answer. But they are sure tied into their Darwinian philosophy of science because they have already eliminated God from their belief system. Fifthly, secular psychology. The secularist in their way that they look at man, it's all about self-image and self-actualization. It's all about self. That's why they talk about whooping up people's self-image and making them feel better about themselves. That's why they would be very disappointed in me today. Because I'm just following Paul's words and I'm not doing a whole lot to make you feel better about yourself. I hope you'll hang with me. Hope you'll come back. Because we're going to get to verses uh, 4 and following, which does change the picture. But not because of who we are, but God. But I think we need to see the black before we can see the light. Secular sociology. The socialist in our day would say that society is evil. Excuse me. Man is evil because society is evil. So if we just clean up society, we can clean up man. What they fail to recognize is society is evil because man is evil. And you have to change man. And you can't change him for any lasting without the inside. Secular law. Because there is no God, because man is the highest form of evolution, the secularist would say in law, government is sovereign. They get it all. You, you, I hope I haven't lost you completely. I probably have. My point is, is that we walk according to the course of this world. And I want us to try to understand a little bit about the way the world thinks because here's the problem. Some of us are still walking in that way, even when we claim to be a Christian. And if we don't change our thinking, if we still walk in this way, then we're just walking according to the world, okay? So did I, are you, I mean, so try to hang with me. I know this is boring. A terrible day. Number eight, real quickly, secular politics. See, because we are all connected, the tree and I are connected, because we all go back to the same Big Bang, because I'm part of the, the, the universe. That's globalism. Nobody's better than anybody else. We're all just in this thing together. 
And man has the answer. You just got to find the right man or woman. Man in a generic sense. Secular economics. Secular economics says you need to keep getting more and more and more and spend it on yourself. Secular economics says I need to get ahead. That's why we see people that are more than willing to step over people and step on people and do some of the most horrendous things because they are bent on getting ahead. Secular history. This is the one that I think, for me at least, makes the most sense. Secular history. A secular historian would say there is no plan, no purpose to history. It's all a bunch of accidents. It just kind of all happened. This happened and then that happened and then these other things happened. And folks, listen, the Bible is totally different. There is an absolute plan and purpose to God's direction of history. But secularism says, no, there's no plan, there's no purpose. And lastly, number 11, I would just, and I, that's why I left it as last, I think it kind of sums the whole thing up. The secular religion, and there is that, is simply humanism. But again, man is at the center of everything. Now remember, the Ephesians lived in a very important city, a very secular city. Go back and review, if you need to, Acts 19 and 18. Go back and look at the fact that they brought all of their witchcraft stuff and burned it up. <clears throat> the temple of Diana was there. And these saints had been saved out of a out of a way of the world that was so in contrast to where they are today. And I guess as I wind down, can I, I just need to ask you and I need to ask myself, have I really changed the way I think? Am I thinking differently? You've heard me say it many times, but I'll say it again. Part of the goal of our sanctification is to think Christianly. To be renewed in the spirit of our minds. Paul said it in Romans. Be not transformed, but be renewed in the spirit of your minds. I think if you take one or more of those 11 things, if you jotted any of them down, I believe that if you look at those, you'll say to yourself, wow. That's still impacting us today. And we need to figure out how that we stop walking that way. Well, we're going to stop there. And then I want us to come back and I want us to think about the prince of the power of the air. Wow. Satan himself, huh? And that whole matter of children of wrath. Like I say, it's not a very pretty picture. It's not a very nice thing to look at. But I think if you'll look at it and you'll see yourself in that condition, then God's grace looks so much greater. Where sin abounded, finish it for, for me. Exactly. Grace did much more abound. Oh, and that is the joy of what we have. I, I, so I, I want to end on that more positive note to tell you that as bad as we were, God in his mercy reached us. And he can reach you. So this morning, would you take time? We're going to sing a song and close. Would you take time to say, Lord, have I changed from a child of wrath, from a son of disobedience, from walking to the course of the world, from being dead in trespasses and sins? Ask yourself that question. Have I changed? Have I gone from death to life? If not, we really do ask you to come forward. You can do it in your pew if you want, but just to come and say, Pastor McCarty, could somebody show me what it means to know Christ as my Savior? Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you this morning because the picture that Paul painted was not very pretty. It wasn't very complimentary to us. And how I thank you that you reached down into that sin
and brought us up. That Jesus came to become sin for us. Oh Lord, may we never forget what you did for us in the person of your Son. This morning as we close this service, may you take these things and apply them to our lives, each one of us. How I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we respond this morning,